section forty three of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli a bibliognost a startling literary prophecy recently sent forth from our oracular literature threatens the annihilation of public libraries which are one day to moulder away listen to the vaticinator as conservatories of mental treasures their value in times of darkness and barbarity was incalculable and even in these happier days when men are incited to explore new regions of thought they command respect as depots of methodical and well-ordered references for the researches of the curious but what in one state of society is invaluable may at another be worthless and the progress which the world has made within a very few centuries has considerably reduced the estimation which is due to such establishments we will say more but enough this idea of striking into dust the god of his idolatry the dagon of his devotion is sufficient to terrify the bibliographer who views only a blind samson pulling down the pillars of his temple this future universal inundation of books this superfluity of knowledge in billions and trillions overwhelms the imagination it is now about four hundred years since the art of multiplying books has been discovered and an arithmetician has attempted to calculate the incalculable of these four ages of typography which he discovers have actually produced three million six hundred and forty one thousand nine hundred and sixty works taking each work at three volumes and reckoning only each impression to consist of three hundred copies which is too little the actual amount from the presses of europe will give to eighteen sixteen three billion two hundred and seventy seven million seven hundred and sixty four thousand volumes each of which being an inch thick if placed on a line would cover six thousand sixty nine leagues leibnitz facetiously maintained that such would be the increase of literature that future generations would find whole cities insufficient to contain their libraries we are however indebted to the patriotic endeavours of our grocers and trunk makers alchemists of literature they annihilate the gross bodies without injuring the finer spirits we are still more indebted to that neglected race the bibliographers the science of books for so bibliography is sometimes dignified may deserve the gratitude of a public who are yet insensible of the useful zeal of those book practitioners the nature of whose labours is yet so imperfectly comprehended who is this vaticinator of the uselessness of public libraries is he a bibliognost or a bibliograph or a bibliomane or a bibliophile or a bibliotaph a bibliothecaire or a bibliopole the prophet cannot be for the bibliothecaire is too delightfully busied among his shelves and the bibliopole is too profitably concerned in furnishing perpetual additions to admit of this hyperbolical terror of annihilation footnote will this writer pardon me for ranking him for a moment among those generalizers of the age who excel in what a critical friend has happily discriminated as ambitious writing that is writing on any topic and not least strikingly on that of which they know least men otherwise of fine taste and who excel in every charm of composition End of footnote unawares we have dropped into that professional jargon which was chiefly forged by one who though seated in the scorner's chair was the thaumaturgus of books and manuscripts 
the abbe rive had acquired a singular taste and curiosity not without a fermenting dash of singular charlanterie in bibliography the little volumes he occasionally put forth are things which but few hands have touched he knew well that for some books to be noised about they should not be read this was one of those recondite mysteries of his which we may have occasion farther to reveal this bibliographical hero was librarian to the most magnificent of book collectors the duc de la valliere the abbe rive was a strong but ungovernable brute rabid surly but très mordant his master whom i have discovered to have been the partner of the cur's tricks would often pat him and when the bibliognos and the bibliomanes were in the heat of contest let his bulldog loose among them as the duke affectionately called his librarian the bulldog of bibliography appears too to have had the taste and appetite of the tiger of politics but he hardly lived to join the festival of the guillotine i judge of this by an expression he used to one complaining of his parish priest whom he advised to give un mess dans son ventre he had tried to exhaust his genius in la chasse au bibliographe et au antiquaire mal avisé and acted cain with his brothers all europe was to receive from him new ideas concerning books and manuscripts yet all his mighty promises fumed away in projects and though he appeared for ever correcting the blunders of others this french ritson left enough of his own to afford them a choice of revenge his style of criticism was perfectly ritsonian he describes one of his rivals as l'insolent et très insensé autour de l'almanach de gotha on the simple subject of the origin of playing cards the abbe rive was one of those men of letters of whom there are not a few who pass all their lives in preparations dr dibden since the above was written has witnessed the confusion of the mind and the gigantic industry of our bibliognost which consisted of many trunks full of memoranda the description will show the reader to what hard hunting these book hunters voluntarily doom themselves with little hope of obtaining fame in one trunk were about six thousand notices of manuscripts of all ages in another were wedged about twelve thousand descriptions of books in all languages except those of french and italian sometimes with critical notes in a third trunk was a bundle of papers relating to the history of the troubadours in a fourth was a collection of memoranda and literary sketches connected with the invention of arts and sciences with pieces exclusively bibliographical a fifth trunk contained between two and three thousand cards written upon each side respecting a collection of prints in a sixth trunk were contained his papers respecting earthquakes volcanoes and geographical subjects footnote the late william upcott possessed in a large degree a similar taste for miscellaneous collections he never threw an old hat away but used it as a receptacle for certain cuttings from books and periodicals on some peculiar subjects he had filled a room with hats and trunks thus crammed but they were sacrificed at his death for want of necessary arrangement End of footnote. this ajax phalagelifer of the bibliographical tribe who was as dr dibden observes the terror of his acquaintance and the pride of his patron is said to have been in private a very different man from his public character all which may be true without altering a shade of that public character the french revolution showed how men mild and even kind in domestic life were sanguinary and ferocious in their public 
the rabbit abbe rive glorified and terrifying without enlightening his rivals he exulted that he was devoting to the rods of criticism and the laughter of europe the bibliopoles or dealers in books who would not get by heart his catechism of a thousand and one questions and answers it broke the slumbers of honest de bure who had found life was already too short for his own bibliographie instructive the abbe rive had contrived to catch the shades of the appellatives necessary to discriminate book amateurs and of the first term he is acknowledged to be the inventor a bibliognost from the greek is one knowing in title pages and colophons and in editions the place and year when printed the presses whence issued and all the minutiae of a book a bibliograph is a describer of books and other literary arrangements a bibliomane is an indiscriminate accumulator who blunders faster than he buys cock-brained and purse-heavy a bibliophile the lover of books is the only one in the class who appears to read them for his own pleasure a bibliotaph buries his books by keeping them under lock or framing them in glass cases i shall catch our bibliognost in the hour of book rapture it will produce a collection of bibliographical writers and show to the second-sighted edinburgh what human contrivances have been raised by the art of more painful writers than himself either to postpone the day of universal annihilation or to preserve for our posterity three centuries hence the knowledge which now so busily occupies us and transmit to them something more than what bacon calls inventories of our literary treasures histories and literary bibliothèques or bibliothecas will always present to us says la rive an immense harvest of errors till the authors of such catalogues shall be fully impressed by the importance of their art and as it were reading in the most distant ages of the future the literary good and evil which they may produce force a triumph from the pure devotion to truth in spite of all the disgusts which their professional tasks involve still patiently enduring the heavy chains which bind down those who give themselves up to this pursuit with a passion which resembles heroism the catalogues of bibliotheque fiques or critical historical and classified accounts of writers have engendered that enormous swarm of bibliographical errors which have spread their roots in greater or less quantities in all our bibliographers he has here furnished a long list which i shall preserve in the note footnote gesserner simler bellarmine labbe mabillon montfaucon moriai bayle baillet niceron dupin Cahouet, Wharton, Casimir Houdin, Lelong, Gouget, Wolfus, John Albert Fabricius, Argelati, Tirabaski, Nicholas Antonio, Walkius, Struvius, Brucker, Schnauzer, Linnaeus, Seguet, Halle, Adamson, Manger, Kessner, Eloy, Douglas, Wheedler, Hal Bronner, Montucla, Lalon, Bailly, Quadrio, Mohoff, Strolliou, Fontius, Gerdesius, Votes, Freitag, Davy Clement, Chevillier, Mater, Orlandi, Prosper Marchand, Chaplin, De Beauze, Abbe Sarguier, et de Saint Lager. End of footnote the list though curious is by no means complete such are the men of whom the abbe rive speaks with more respect than his accustomed courtesy if such says he cannot escape from errors who shall i have only marked them out to prove the importance of bibliographical history a writer of this sort must occupy himself with more regard for his reputation than his own profit and yield himself up entirely to the study of books 
the mere knowledge of books which has been called an erudition of title-pages may be sufficient to occupy the life of some and while the wits and the million are ridiculing these hunters of editions who force their passage through secluded spots as well as coarse in the open fields it would be found that this art of book knowledge may turn out to be a very philosophical pursuit and that men of great name have devoted themselves to labours more frequently contemned than comprehended apostolo zeno a poet a critic and a true man of letters considered it as no small portion of his glory to have annotated fontanini who himself an eminent prelate had passed his life in forming his bibliotheca italiana zeno did not consider that to correct errors and to enrich by information this catalogue of italian writers was a mean task the enthusiasm of the abbe reeve considered bibliography as a sublime pursuit exclaiming on zeno's commentary on fontanini he chained together the knowledge of whole generations for posterity and he read in future ages there are few things by which we can so well trace the history of the human mind as by a classed catalogue with dates of the first publication of books even the relative prices of books at different periods their decline and then their rise and again their fall form a chapter in this history of the human mind we become critics even by this literary chronology and this appraisement of auctioneers the favourite book of every age is a certain picture of the people the gradual depreciation of a great author marks a change in knowledge or in taste but it is imagined that we are not interested in the history of indifferent writers and scarcely in that of the secondary ones if none but great originals should claim our attention in the course of two thousand years we should not count twenty authors every book whatever be its character may be considered as a new experiment made by the human understanding and as a book is a sort of individual representation not a solitary volume exists but may be personified and described as a human being hence start discoveries they are usually found in very different authors who could go no further and the historian of obscure books is often preserving for men of genius indications of knowledge which without his intervention we should not possess many secrets we discover in bibliography great writers unskilled in this science of books have frequently used defective editions as hume did the castrated whitelock or like robertson they are ignorant of even the sources of the knowledge they would give the public or they compose on a subject which too late they discover had been anticipated bibliography will show what has been done and suggest to our invention what is wanted many have often protracted their journey in a road which had already been worn out by the wheels which had traversed it bibliography unrolls the whole map of the country we propose travelling over the post-roads and the by-paths every half-century indeed the obstructions multiply and the edinburgh prediction should it approximate to the event it has foreseen may more reasonably terrify a far distant posterity Matsuchelli declared after his laborious researches in italian literature that one of his more recent predecessors who had commenced a similar work had collected notices of forty thousand writers and yet he adds my work must increase that number to ten thousand more Matsuchelli said this in seventeen fifty three and the amount of nearly a century must now be added for the presses of italy have not been inactive but the literature of germany of france and of england has exceeded the multiplicity of the productions of italy and an appalling population of authors swarm before the imagination footnote the british museum library now numbers more than five hundred thousand volumes the catalogue alone forms a small library End of footnote. 
hail then the peaceful spirit of the literary historian which sitting amidst the night of time by the monuments of genius trims the sepulchral lamps of the human mind hail to the literary roamer who by the clearness of his glasses makes even the minute interesting and reveals to us the world of insects these are guardian spirits who at the close of every century standing on its ascent trace out the old roads we had pursued and with a lighter line indicate the new ones which are opening from the imperfect attempts and even the errors of our predecessors End of section forty three section forty four of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli secret history of an elective monarchy a political sketch poland once a potent and magnificent kingdom when it sunk into an elective monarchy became venal thrice an age that country must have exhibited many a diplomatic scene of intricate intrigue which although they could not appear in its public have no doubt been often consigned to its secret history with us the corruption of a rotten borough has sometimes exposed the guarded proffer of one party and the dexterous chaffering of the other but a masterpiece of diplomatic finesse and political invention electioneering viewed on the most magnificent scale with a kingdom to be canvassed and a crown to be won and lost or lost and won in the course of a single day exhibits a political drama which for the honour and happiness of mankind is of rare and strange occurrence there was one scene in this drama which might appear somewhat too large for an ordinary theatre the actors apparently were not less than fifty to a hundred thousand twelve vast tents were raised on an extensive plain a hundred thousand horses were in the environs and palatines and castellans the ecclesiastical orders with the ambassadors of the royal competitors all agitated by the ceaseless motion of different factions during the six weeks of the election and of many preceding months of preconcerted measures and vacillating opinions now were all solemnly assembled at the diet once the poet amidst his gigantic conception of a scene resolved to leave it out so vast a throng the stage can ne'er contain then build a new or act it in a plain exclaimed la mancha's knight kindling at a scene so novel and so vast such an electioneering negotiation the only one i am acquainted with is opened in the discours of choisin the secretary of montluc bishop of valence the confidential agent of catherine de medici and who was sent to intrigue at the polish diet to obtain the crown of poland for her son the duke of anjou afterwards henry the third this bold enterprise at first seemed hopeless and in its progress encountered growing obstructions but montluc was one of the most finished diplomatists that the genius of the gallic cabinet ever sent forth he was nicknamed in all the courts of europe from the circumstance of his limping le boiteau our political bishop was in cabinet intrigues the talleyrand of his age and sixteen embassies to italy germany england scotland and turkey had made this connoisseur en homme an extraordinary politician catherine de medici was infatuated with the dreams of judicial astrology her pensioned oracles had declared that she should live to see 
each of her sons crowned by which prediction probably they had only purposed to flatter her pride and her love of dominion they however ended in terrifying the credulous queen and she dreading to witness a throne in france disputed perhaps by fratricides anxiously sought a separate crown for each of her three sons she had been trifled with in her earnest negotiations with our elizabeth twice had she seen herself baffled in her views in the dukes of alencon and of anjou catherine then projected a new empire for anjou by incorporating into one kingdom algiers corsica and sardinia but the other despot he of constantinople selim the second dissipated the brilliant speculation of our female machiavel charles the ninth was sickly jealous and desirous of removing from the court the duke of anjou whom two victories had made popular though he afterwards sunk into a sardanapalus montluc penetrated into the secret wishes of catherine and charles and suggested to them the possibility of encircling the brows of anjou with the diadem of poland the polish monarch then being in a state of visible decline the project was approved and like a profound politician the bishop prepared for an event which might be remote and always problematical by sending into poland a natural son of his balogny as a disguised agent his youth his humble rank and his love of pleasure would not create any alarm among the neighbouring powers who were alike on the watch to snatch the expected spoil but as it was necessary to have a more dexterous politician behind the curtain he recommended his secretary choisin as a travelling tutor to a youth who appeared to want one balagny proceeded to poland where under the veil of dissipation and in the midst of splendid festivities with his trusty adjutant this hare-brained boy of revelry began to weave those intrigues which were afterwards to be knotted or untied by montluc himself he had contrived to be so little suspected that the agent of the emperor had often disclosed important secrets to his young and amiable friend on the death of sigismund augustus balagny leaving choisnin behind to trumpet forth the virtues of anjou hastened to paris to give an account of all which he had seen or heard but poor choisnin found himself in a dilemma among those who had so long listened to his panegyrics on the humanity and meek character of the duke of anjou for the news of st bartholomew's massacre had travelled faster than the post and choisnin complains that he was now treated as an impudent liar and the french prince as a monster in vain he assured them that the whole was an exaggerated account a mere insurrection of the people or the effects of a few private enmities praying the indignant poles to suspend their decision till the bishop came attendez le boiteau cried he in agony meanwhile at paris the choice of a proper person for this embassy had been difficult to settle it was a business of intrigue more than of form and required an orator to make speeches and addresses in a sort of popular assembly for though the people indeed had no concern in the diet yet the greater and the lesser nobles and gentlemen all electors were reckoned at one hundred thousand it was supposed that a lawyer who could negotiate in good latin and one as the french proverb runs who could aller et parler would more effectually puzzle their heads and satisfy their consciences to vote for his client catherine at last fixed on montluc himself from the superstitious prejudice which however in this case accorded with philosophical experience that montluc had ever been lucky in his negotiations 
montluc hastened his departure from paris and it appears that our political bishop had by his skilful penetration into the french cabinet foreseen the horrible catastrophe which occurred very shortly after he had left it for he had warned the count de rochefoucault to absent himself but this lord like so many others had no suspicions of the perfidious projects of catherine and her cabinet montluc however had not long been on his journey ere the news reached him and it occasioned innumerable obstacles in his progress which even his sagacity had not calculated on at strasburg he had appointed to meet some able coadjutors among whom was the famous joseph scaliger but they were so terrified by les matinees parisiennes that scaliger flew to geneva and would not budge out of that safe corner and the others ran home not imagining that montluc would venture to pass through germany where the protestant indignation had made the roads too hot for a catholic bishop but montluc had set his cast on the die he had already passed through several hairbreadth escapes from the stratagems of the guise faction who more than once attempted to hang or drown the bishop who they cried out was a calvinist the fears and jealousies of the guises had been roused by this political mission among all these troubles and delays montluc was most affected by the rumour that the election was on the point of being made and that the plague was universal throughout poland so that he must have felt that he might be too late for the one and too early for the other at last montluc arrived and found that the whole weight of this negotiation was to fall on his single shoulders and further that he was to sleep every night on a pillow of thorns our bishop had not only to allay the ferment of the popular spirit of the evangelicals as the protestants were then called but even of the more rational catholics of poland he had also to face those haughty and feudal lords of whom each considered himself the equal of the sovereign whom he created and whose avowed principle was and many were incorrupt that their choice of a sovereign should be regulated solely by the public interest and it was hardly to be expected that the emperor the czar and the king of sweden would prove unsuccessful rivals to the cruel and voluptuous and bigoted duke of anjou whose political interests were too remote and novel to have raised any faction among these independent poles the crafty politician had the art of dressing himself up in all the winning charms of candour and loyalty a sweet flow of honeyed words melted on his lips while his heart cold and immovable as a rock stood unchanged amidst the most unforeseen difficulties the emperor had set to work the abbe seer in a sort of ambiguous character an envoy for the nonce to be acknowledged or disavowed as was convenient and by his activity he obtained considerable influence among the lithuanians the wallachians and nearly all prussia in favour of the archduke ernest two bohemians who had the advantage of speaking the polish language had arrived with a state and magnificence becoming kings rather than ambassadors the muscovite had written letters full of golden promises to the nobility and was supported by a palatine of high character a perpetual peace between two such great neighbours was too inviting a project not to find advocates and this party choisnin observes appeared at first the most to be feared the king of sweden was a close neighbour who had married the sister of their late sovereign and his son urged his family claims as superior to those of foreigners among these parties was a patriotic one who were desirous of a pole for their monarch a king of their fatherland speaking their mother tongue one who would not strike at the independence of his country but preserve its integrity from the stranger 
this popular party was even agreeable to several of the foreign powers themselves who did not like to see a rival power strengthening itself by so strict a union with poland but in this choice of a sovereign from among themselves there were at least thirty lords who equally thought that they were the proper wood of which kings should be carved out the poles therefore could not agree on the pole who deserved to be a piasta an endearing title for a native monarch which originated in the name of the family of the piastus who had reigned happily over the polish people for the space of five centuries the remembrance of their virtues existed in the minds of the honest poles in this affectionate title and their party were called the piastus montluc had been deprived of the assistance he had depended on from many able persons whom the massacre of st bartholomew had frightened away from every french political connection he found that he had himself only to depend on we are told that he was not provided with the usual means which are considered most efficient in elections nor possessed the interest nor the splendour of his powerful competitors he was to derive all his resources from diplomatic finesse the various ambassadors had fixed on distant residences that they might not hold too close an intercourse with the polish nobles of all things he was desirous to obtain an easy access to these chiefs that he might observe and that they might listen he who would seduce by his own ingenuity must come in contact with the object he would corrupt yet montluc persisted in not approaching them without being sought after which answered his purpose in the end one favourite argument which our talleyrand had set afloat was to show that all the benefits which the different competitors had promised to the poles were accompanied by other circumstances which could not fail to be ruinous to the country while the offer of his master whose interests were remote could not be adverse to those of the polish nation so that much good might be expected from him without any fear of accompanying evil montluc procured a clever frenchman to be the bearer of his first dispatch in latin to the diet which had hardly assembled ere suspicions and jealousies were already breaking out the emperor's ambassadors had offended the pride of the polish nobles by travelling about the country without leave and resorting to the infanta and besides in some intercepted letters the polish nation was designated as jean barbara et jean inepta i do not think that the said letter was really written by the said ambassadors who were statesmen too politic to employ such unguarded language very ingeniously writes the secretary of montluc however it was a blow levelled at the imperial ambassadors while the letter of the french bishop composed in a humble and modest style began to melt their proud spirits and two thousand copies of the french bishop's letter were eagerly spread but this good fortune did not last more than four-and-twenty hours mournfully writes our honest secretary for suddenly the news of the fatal day of st bartholomew arrived and every frenchman was detested montluc in this distress published an apology for les matinées parisiennes which he reduced to some excesses of the people the result of a conspiracy plotted by the protestants and he adroitly introduced as a personage his master anjou declaring that he scorned to oppress a party whom he had so often conquered with sword in hand this pamphlet which still exists must have cost the good bishop some invention but in elections the lie of the moment serves a purpose and although montluc was in due time bitterly recriminated on still the apology served to divide public opinion
montluc was a whole cabinet to himself he dispersed another tract in the character of a polish gentleman in which the french interests were urged by such arguments that the leading chiefs never met without disputing and montluc now found that he had succeeded in creating a french party the austrian then employed a real polish gentleman to write for his party but this was too genuine a production for the writer wrote too much in earnest and in politics we must not be in a passion the mutual jealousies of each party assisted the views of our negotiator they would side with him against each other the archduke and the czar opposed the turk the muscovite could not endure that sweden should be aggrandized by this new crown and denmark was still more uneasy montluc had discovered how every party had its vulnerable point by which it could be managed the cards had now got fairly shuffled and he depended on his usual good play our bishop got hold of a palatine to write for the french cause in the vernacular tongue and appears to have held a more mysterious intercourse with another palatine albert lasky mutual accusations were made in the open diet the poles accused some lithuanian lords of having contracted certain engagements with the czar these in return accused the poles and particularly this lasky with being corrupted by the gold of france another circumstance afterwards arose the spanish ambassador had forty thousand thalers sent to him but which never passed the frontiers as this fresh supply arrived too late for the election i believe writes our secretary with great simplicity that this money was only designed to distribute among the trumpeters and the tambourines the usual expedient in contested elections was now evidently introduced our secretary acknowledging that montluc daily acquired new supporters because he did not attempt to gain them over merely by promises resting his whole cause on this argument that the interest of the nation was concerned in the french election still would ill fortune cross our crafty politician when everything was proceeding smoothly the massacre was refreshed with more damning particulars some letters were forged and others were but too true all parties with rival intrepidity were carrying on a complete scene of deception a rumour spread that the french king disavowed his accredited agent and apologised to the emperor for having yielded to the importunities of a political speculator whom he was now resolved to recall this somewhat paralysed the exertions of those palatines who had involved themselves in the intrigues of montluc who was now forced patiently to wait for the arrival of a courier with renewed testimonials of his diplomatic character from the french court a great odium was cast on the french in the course of this negotiation by a distribution of prints which exposed the most inventive cruelties practised by the catholics on the reformed such as women cleaved in half in the act of attempting to snatch their children from their butchers while charles the ninth and the duke of anjou were hideously represented in their persons and as spectators of such horrid tragedies with words written in labels complaining that the executioners were not zealous enough in this holy work these prints accompanied by libels and by horrid narratives inflamed the popular indignation and more particularly the women who were affected to tears as if these horrid scenes had been passing before their eyes montluc replied to the libels as fast as they appeared while he skilfully introduced the most elaborate panegyrics on the duke of anjou and in return for the caricatures he distributed two portraits of the king and the duke to show the ladies if not the diet that neither of these princes had such ferocious and inhuman faces such are the small means by which the politician condescends to work his great designs and the very means by which his enemies thought they should ruin his cause montluc adroitly turned to his own advantage 
anything of instant occurrence serves electioneering purposes and monluc eagerly seized this favourable occasion to exhaust his imagination on an ideal sovereign and to hazard with address anecdotes whose authenticity he could never have proved till he perplexed even unwilling minds to be uncertain whether that intolerant and inhuman duke was not the most heroic and most merciful of princes it is probable that the frenchman abused even the license of the french eloge for a noble paul to montluc that he was always amplifying his duke with such ideal greatness and attributing to him such immaculate purity of sentiment that it was inferred there was no man in poland who could possibly equal him and that his declaration that the duke was not desirous of reigning over poland to possess the wealth and grandeur of the kingdom and that he was solely ambitious of the honour to be the head of such a great and virtuous nobility had offended many lords who did not believe that the duke sought the polish crown merely to be the sovereign of a virtuous people these polish statesmen appear indeed to have been more enlightened than the subtle politician perhaps calculated on for when montluc was over anxious to exculpate the duke of anjou from having been an actor in the parisian massacre a noble pole observed that he need not lose his time at framing any apologies for if he could prove that it was the interest of the country that the duke ought to be elected their king it was all that was required his cruelty were it true would be no reason to prevent his election for we have nothing to dread from it once in our kingdom he will have more reason to fear us than we him should he ever attempt our lives our property or our liberty another polish lord whose scruples were as pious as his patriotism was suspicious however observed that in his conferences with the french bishop the bishop had never once mentioned god whom all parties ought to implore to touch the hearts of the electors in the choice of god's anointed montluc might have felt himself unexpectedly embarrassed at the religious scruples of this lord but the politician was never at a fault speaking to a man of letters as his lordship was replied the french bishop it was not for him to remind his lordship what he so well knew but since he had touched on the subject he would however say that were a sick man desirous of having a physician the friend who undertook to procure one would not do his duty should he say it was necessary to call in one whom god had chosen to restore his health but another who should say that the most learned and skilful is he whom god has chosen would be doing the best for the patient and evince most judgment by a parity of reason we must believe that god will not send an angel to point out the man whom he would have his anointed sufficient for us that god has given us a knowledge of the requisites of a good king and if the polish gentlemen choose such a sovereign it will be him who god has chosen this shrewd argument delighted the polish lord who repeated the story in different companies to the honour of the bishop and in this manner adds the secretary with great naivete did the sieur strengthened by good arguments divulge his opinions which were received by many and run from hand to hand montluc had his inferior manoeuvres he had to equipoise the opposite interests of the catholics and the evangelists or the reformed it was mingling fire and water without suffering them to hiss or to extinguish one another when the imperial ambassadors gave fetes to the higher nobility only they consequently offended the lesser the frenchman gave no banquets but his house was open to all at all times who were equally welcome you will see that the fetes of the imperialists will do them more harm than good observed montluc to his secretary having gained over by every possible contrivance a number of the polish nobles and showered his courtesies on those of the inferior orders at length the critical moment approached and the finishing hand was to be put to the work 
poland with the appearance of a popular government was a singular aristocracy of a hundred thousand electors consisting of the higher and the lower nobility and the gentry the people had no concern with the government yet still it was to be treated by the politician as a popular government where those who possessed the greatest influence over such large assemblies were orators and he who delivered himself with the most fluency and the most pertinent arguments would infallibly bend every heart to the point he wished the french bishop depended greatly on the effect which his oration was to produce when the ambassadors were respectively to be heard before the assembled diet the great and concluding act of so many tedious and difficult negotiations which had cost my master writes the ingenuous secretary six months daily and nightly labours he had never been assisted or comforted by any but his poor servants and in the course of these six months had written ten reams of paper a thing which for forty years he had not used himself to every ambassador was now to deliver an oration before the assembled electors and thirty-two copies were to be printed to present one to each palatine who in his turn was to communicate it to his lords but a fresh difficulty occurred to the french negotiator as he trusted greatly to his address influencing the multitude and creating a popular opinion in his favour he regretted to find that the imperial ambassador would deliver his speech in the bohemian language so that he would be understood by the greater part of the assembly a considerable advantage over montluc who could only address them in latin the inventive genius of the french bishop resolved on two things which had never before been practised first to have his latin translated into the vernacular idiom and secondly to print an edition of fifteen hundred copies in both languages and thus to obtain a vast advantage over the other ambassadors with their thirty-two manuscript copies of which each copy was used to be read to one thousand two hundred persons the great difficulty was to get it secretly translated and printed this fell to the management of choisnin the secretary he set off to the castle of the palatine solikotsky who was deep in the french interest solikotsky dispatched the version in six days hastening with the precious manuscript to krakow choisnin flew to a trusty printer with whom he was connected the sheets were deposited every night at choisnin's lodgings and at the end of a fortnight the diligent secretary conducted the one thousand five hundred copies in secret triumph to warsaw yet this glorious labour was not ended montluc was in no haste to deliver his wonder-working oration on which the fate of a crown seemed to depend when his turn came to be heard he suddenly fell sick the fact was that he wished to speak last which would give him the advantage of replying to any objection raised by his rivals and admit also of an attack on their weak points he contrived to obtain copies of their harangues and discovered five points which struck at the french interest our poor bishop had now to sit up through the night to rewrite five leaves of his printed oration and cancel five which had been printed and worse he had to get them by heart and to have them translated and inserted by employing twenty scribes day and night it is scarcely credible what my master went through about this time saith the historian of his jests the council or diet was held in a vast plain twelve pavilions were raised to receive the polish nobility and the ambassadors one of a circular form was supported by a single mast and was large enough to contain six thousand persons without any one approaching the mast nearer than by twenty steps leaving this space void to preserve silence 
the different orders were placed around the archbishop and the bishops the palatines the castellans each according to their rank during the six weeks of the sittings of the diet one hundred thousand horses were in the environs yet forage and every sort of provisions abounded there were no disturbances not a single quarrel occurred although there wanted not in that meeting for enmities of long standing it was strange and even awful to view such a mighty assembly preserving the greatest order and every one seriously intent on this solemn occasion at length the elaborate oration was delivered it lasted three hours and choisnin assures us not a single auditor felt weary a cry of joy broke out from the tent and was re-echoed through the plain when montluc ceased it was a public acclamation and had the election been fixed for that moment when all hearts were warm surely the duke had been chosen without a dissenting voice thus writes in rapture the ingenuous secretary and in the spirit of the times communicates a delightful augury attending this speech by which evidently was foreseen its happy termination those who disdain all things will take this to be a mere invention of mine says honest choisnin but true it is that while the said sieur delivered his harangue a lark was seen all the while upon the mast of the pavilion singing and warbling which was remarked by a great number of lords because the lark is accustomed only to rest itself on the earth the most impartial confess this to be a good augury footnote our honest secretary reminds me of a passage in geoffrey of monmouth who says at this place an eagle spoke while the wall of the town was building and indeed i should not have failed transmitting the speech to posterity had i thought it true as the rest of the history in the footnote also it was observed that when the other ambassadors were speaking a hare and at another time a hog ran through the tent and when the swedish ambassador spoke the great tent fell half-way down this lark singing all the while did no little good to our cause for many of the nobles and gentry noticed this curious particularity because when a thing which does not commonly happen occurs in a public affair such appearances give rise to hopes either of good or of evil the singing of this lark in favour of the duke of anjou is not so evident as the cunning trick of the other french agent the political bishop of valence who now reaped the full advantage of his one thousand five hundred copies over the thirty-two of his rivals every one had the french one in hand or read it to his friends while the others in manuscript were confined to a very narrow circle the period from the tenth of april to the sixth of may when they proceeded to the election proved to be an interval of infinite perplexities troubles and activity it is probable that the secret history of this period of the negotiations was never written the other ambassadors were for protracting the election perceiving the french interest prevalent but delay would not serve the purpose of montluc he not being so well provided with friends and means on the spot as the others were the public opinion which he had succeeded in creating by some unforeseen circumstance might change during this interval the bishop had to put several agents of the other parties hors de combat he got rid of a formidable adversary in the cardinal commandant an agent of the pope's whom he proved ought not to be present at the election and the cardinal was ordered to take his departure a bullying colonel was set upon the french negotiator and went about from tent to tent with a list of the debts of the duke of anjou to show that the nation could expect nothing profitable from a ruined spendthrift the page of a polish count flew to montluc for protection entreating permission to accompany the bishop on his return to paris the servants of the count pursued the page but this young gentleman had so insinuated himself into the favour of the bishop that he was suffered to remain 
the next day the page desired montluc would grant him the full liberty of his religion being an evangelical that he might communicate this to his friends and thus fix them to the french party montluc was too penetrating for this young political agent whom he discovered to be a spy and the pursuit of his fellows to have been a farce he sent the page back to his master the evangelical count observing that such tricks were too gross to be played on one who had managed affairs in all the courts of europe before he came into poland another alarm was raised by a letter from the grand vizier of selim the second addressed to the diet in which he requested that they would either choose a king from among themselves or elect the brother of the king of france some zealous frenchmen at the sublime port had officiously procured this recommendation from the enemy of christianity but an alliance with mahometanism did no service to montluc either with the catholics or the evangelicals the bishop was in despair and thought that his handiwork of six months toil and trouble was to be shook into pieces in an hour montluc being shown the letter instantly insisted that it was a forgery designed to injure his master the duke the letter was attended by some suspicious circumstances and the french bishop quick at expedients snatched at an advantage which the politician knows how to lay hold of in the chapter of accidents the letter was not sealed with the golden seal nor enclosed in a silken purse or cloth of gold and farther if they examined the translation he said they would find that it was not written on turkish paper this was a piece of the good fortune for the letter was not forged but owing to the circumstance that the boyar of valachia had taken out the letter to send a translation with it which the vizier had omitted it arrived without its usual accompaniments and the courier when inquired after was kept out of the way so that in a few days nothing more was heard of the great vizier's letter such was our fortunate escape says the secretary from the friendly but fatal interference of the sultan than which the sewer dreaded nothing so much many secret agents of the different powers were spinning their dark intrigues and often when discovered or disconcerted the creatures were again at their dirty work these agents were conveniently disavowed or acknowledged by their employers the abbe sire was an active agent of the emperor's and though not publicly accredited was still hovering about in lithuania he had contrived matters so well as to have gained over that important province for the archduke and was passing through prussia to hasten to communicate with the emperor but some honest men quelque bon personnage says the french secretary and no doubt some good friends of his master took him by surprise and laid him up safely in the castle of marienburg where truly he was a little uncivilly used by the soldiers who rifled his portmanteau and sent us his papers when we discovered all his foul practices the emperor it seems was angry at the arrest of his secret agent but as no one had the power of releasing the abbe sire at that moment what with receiving remonstrances and furnishing replies the time passed away and a very troublesome adversary was in safe custody during the election the dissensions between the catholics and the evangelicals were always on the point of breaking out but montluc succeeded in quieting these inveterate parties by terrifying their imaginations with sanguinary civil wars and invasions of the turks and the tartars he satisfied the catholics with the hope that time would put an end to heresy and the evangelicals were glad to obtain a truce from persecution the day before the election montluc found himself so confident that he dispatched a courier to the french court and expressed himself in the true style of a speculative politician that des deux tables du damier nous en avons les neuf assurés 
there were preludes to the election and the first was probably in acquiescence with a saturnalian humour prevalent in some countries where the lower orders are only allowed to indulge their taste for the mockery of the great at stated times and on fixed occasions a droll scene of a mock election as well as combat took place between the numerous polish pages who saith the grave secretary are still more mischievous than our own these elected among themselves for competitors made a senate to burlesque the diet and went to loggerheads those who represented the archduke were well beaten the swede was hunted down and for the piastis they seized on a cart belonging to a gentleman laden with provisions broke it into pieces and burnt the axle-tree which in that country is called a piasti and cried out the piasti is burnt nor could the senators at the diet that day command any order or silence the french party wore white handkerchiefs in their hats and they were so numerous as to defeat the others the next day however opened a different scene the nobles prepared to deliberate and each palatine in his quarters was with his companions on their knees and many with tears in their eyes chanting a hymn to the holy ghost it must be confessed that this looked like a work of god says our secretary who probably understood the manoeuvring of the mock combat or the mock prayers much better than we may everything tells at an election burlesque or solemnity the election took place and the duke of anjou was proclaimed king of poland but the troubles of montluc did not terminate when they presented certain articles for his signature the bishop discovered that these had undergone material alterations from the proposals submitted to him before the proclamation these alterations referred to a disavowal of the parisian massacre the punishment of its authors and toleration in religion montluc refused to sign and cross-examined his polish friends about the original proposals one party agreed that some things had been changed but that they were too trivial to lose a crown for others declared that the alterations were necessary to allay the fears or secure the safety of the people our gallic diplomatist was outwitted and after all his intrigues and cunning he found that the crown of poland was only to be delivered on conditional terms in this dilemma with a crown depending on a stroke of his pen remonstrating entreating arguing and still delaying like ancient pistol swallowing his leak he witnessed with alarm some preparations for a new election and his rivals on the watch with their protests montluc in despair signed the conditions assured however says the secretary who groans over this finale that when the elected monarch should arrive the states would easily be induced to correct them and place things in statu quo as before the proclamation i was not a witness being then dispatched to paris with the joyful news but i heard that the sieur evesque it was thought would have died in this agony of being reduced to the hard necessity either to sign or to lose the fruits of his labours the conditions were afterwards for a long while disputed in france de tu informs us in Liber fifty seven of his history that montluc after signing these conditions wrote to his master that he was not bound by them because they did not concern poland in general and that they had compelled him to sign what at the same time he had informed them his instructions did not authorize such was the true jesuitic conduct of a grey-haired politician who at length found that honest plain sense could embarrass and finally entrap the creature of the cabinet the artificial genius of diplomatic finesse the secretary however views nothing but his master's glory in the issue of this most difficult negotiation and the triumph of anjou over the youthful archduke whom the poles might have moulded to their will and over the king of sweden who claimed the crown by his queen's side and had offered to unite his part of livonia with that which the poles possessed he labours hard to prove that the palatines and the castellans were not pratique that is had their votes brought up by 
montluc as was reported from their number and their opposite interests he confesses that the sieur of esque slept little while in poland and that he only gained over the hearts of men by that natural gift of god which acquired him the title of the happy ambassador he rather seems to regret that france was not prodigal of her purchase money than to affirm that all palatines were alike scrupulous of their honour one more fact may close this political sketch a lesson of the nature of court gratitude the french court affected to receive choisnin with favour but their suppressed discontent was reserved for the happy ambassador affairs had changed charles the ninth was dying and catherine de medici in despair for a son to whom she had sacrificed all while anjou already immersed in the wantonness of youth and pleasure considered his elevation to the throne of poland as an exile which separated him from his depraved enjoyments montluc was rewarded only by incurring disgrace catherine de medici and the duke of anjou now looked coldly on him and expressed their dislike of his successful mission the mother of kings as choisnin designates catherine de medici to whom he addresses his memoirs with the hope of awakening her recollections of the zeal the genius and the success of his old master had no longer any use for her favourite and montluc found as the commentator of choisnin expresses in a few words an important truth in political morality that at court the interest of the moment is the measure of its affections and its hatreds Footnote i have drawn up this article for the curiosity of its subject and its details from the discours au frais de tout ce qui s'est fait et passé pour l'entière négociation de l'excision du roi du pologne divisé en trois livres par johan choisnin du chantelleron naguère secrétaire de m levesque de valence fifteen seventy four in the footnote end of section forty four section forty five of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli buildings in the metropolis and residence in the country recently more than one of our learned judges from the bench have perhaps astonished their auditors by impressing them with an old-fashioned notion of residing more on their estates than the fashionable modes of life and the esprit de société now overpowering all other esprit will ever admit these opinions excited my attention to a curious circumstance in the history of our manners the great anxiety of our government from the days of elizabeth till much later than those of charles the second to preserve the kingdom from the evils of an overgrown metropolis the people themselves indeed participated in the same alarm at the growth of the city while however they themselves were perpetuating the grievance which they complained of it is amusing to observe that although the government was frequently employing even their most forcible acts to restrict the limits of the metropolis the suburbs were gradually incorporating with the city and westminster at length united itself to london since that happy marriage their fertile progenies have so blended together that little londons are no longer distinguishable from the ancient parent we have succeeded in spreading the capital into a county and have verified the prediction of james i that england will shortly be london and london england i think it a great object said justice best in delivering his sentiments in favour of the game laws that gentlemen should have a temptation to reside in the country amongst their neighbours and tenantry whose interests must be materially advanced 
by such a circumstance the links of society are thereby better preserved and the mutual advantages and dependence of the higher and lower classes on one another are better maintained the baneful effects of our present system we have lately seen in a neighbouring country and an ingenious french writer has lately shown the ill consequences of it on the continent these sentiments of a living luminary of the law afford some reason of policy for the dread which our government long entertained on account of the perpetual growth of the metropolis the nation like a hypochondriac was ludicrously terrified that their head was too monstrous for their body and that it drew all the moisture of life from the middle and the extremities proclamations warned and exhorted but the very interference of a royal prohibition seemed to render the crowded city more charming in vain the statute against new buildings was passed by elizabeth in vain during the reigns of james i and both the charleses we find proclamations continually issuing to forbid new erections james was apt to throw out his opinions in these frequent addresses to the people who never attended to them his majesty notices those swarms of gentry who through the instigation of their wives or to new model and fashion their daughters who if they were unmarried marred their reputations and if married lost them did neglect their country hospitality and cumber the city a general nuisance to the kingdom he addressed the star chamber to regulate the exorbitancy of the new buildings about the city which were but a shelter for those who when they had spent their estates in coaches lackeys and fine clothes like frenchmen lived miserably in their houses like italians but the honour of the english nobility and gentry is to be hospitable among their tenants once conversing on this subject the monarch threw out that happy illustration which has been more than once noticed that gentlemen resident on their estates were like ships in port their value and magnitude were felt and acknowledged but when at a distance as their size seemed insignificant so their worth and importance were not duly estimated footnote a proclamation was issued in the first year of king james commanding gentlemen to depart the court and city because it hinders hospitality and endangers the people near their own residences who had from such houses much comfort and ease toward their living the king graciously says he took no small contentment in the resort of gentlemen and other our subjects coming to visit us holding their affectionate desire to see our person to be a certain testimony of their inward love but he says he must not give way to so great a mischief as the continual resort may breed and that therefore all that have no special cause of attendance must at once go back until the time of his coronation when they may return until the solemnity be passed but only for that time for if the proclamation be slighted he shall make them an example of contempt if we shall find any making stay here contrary to this direction such proclamations were from time to time issued and though sometimes evaded were frequently enforced by fines so that living in london was a risk and danger to country gentlemen of fortune End of footnote. a manuscript writer of the times complains of the breaking up of old family establishments all crowding to upstart london every one strives to be a diogenes in his house and an emperor in the streets not caring if they sleep in a tub so they may be hurried in a coach giving that allowance to horses and mares that formerly maintained houses full of men pinching many a belly to paint a few backs and bearing all the treasures of the kingdom into a few citizens coffers 
their woods into wardrobes their leases into laces and their goods and chattels into guarded coats and gaudy toys such is the representation of an eloquent contemporary and however contracted might have been his knowledge of the principles of political economy and of that prosperity which a wealthy nation is said to derive from its consumption of articles of luxury the moral effects have not altered nor has the scene in reality greatly changed the government not only frequently forbade new buildings within ten miles of london but sometimes ordered them to be pulled down after they had been erected for several years every six or seven years proclamations were issued in charles the first's reign offenders were sharply prosecuted by a combined operation not only against houses but against persons many of the nobility and gentry in sixteen thirty two were informed against for having resided in the city contrary to the late proclamation and the attorney-general was then fully occupied in filing bills of indictment against them as well as ladies for staying in town the following curious information in the star chamber will serve our purpose the attorney-general informs his majesty that both elizabeth and james by several proclamations had commanded that persons of livelihood and means should reside in their counties and not abide or sojourn in the city of london so that counties remain unserved these proclamations were renewed by charles the first who had observed a greater number of nobility and gentry and abler sort of people with their families had resorted to the cities of london and westminster residing there contrary to the ancient usage of the english nation by their abiding in their several counties where their means arise they would not only have served his majesty according to their ranks but by their housekeeping in those parts the meaner sort of people formerly were guided directed and relieved he accuses them of wasting their estates in the metropolis which would employ and relieve the common people in their several counties the loose and disorderly people that follow them living in and about the cities are so numerous that they are not easily governed by the ordinary magistrates mendicants increase in great numbers the prices of all commodities are highly raised etc the king had formerly proclaimed that all ranks who were not connected with public offices at the close of forty days notice should resort to their several counties and with their families continue their residence there and his majesty further warned them not to put themselves to unnecessary charge in providing themselves to return in winter to the said cities as it was the king's firm resolution to withstand such great and growing evil the information concludes with a most copious list of offenders among whom are a great number of nobility and ladies and gentlemen who were accused of having lived in london for several months after the given warning of forty days it appears that most of them to elude the grasp of the law had contrived to make a show of quitting the metropolis and after a short absence had again returned and thus the service of your majesty and your people in the several counties had been neglected and undone such is the substance of this curious information which enables us at least to collect the ostensible motives of this singular prohibition proclamations had hitherto been considered little more than the news of the morning and three days afterwards were as much read as the last week's newspapers they were now however resolved to stretch forth the strong arm of law and to terrify by an example the constables were commanded to bring in a list of the names of strangers and the time they proposed to fix their residence in their parishes a remarkable victim on this occasion was a mr palmer a sussex gentleman who was brought ore tenus into the star chamber 
for disobeying the proclamation for living in the country palmer was a squire of one thousand pounds per annum then a considerable income he appears to have been some rich bachelor for in his defence he alleged that he had never been married never was a housekeeper and had no house fitting for a man of his birth to reside in as his mansion in the country had been burnt down within two years these reasons appeared to his judges to aggravate rather than extenuate his offence and after a long reprimand for having deserted his tenants and neighbours they heavily fined him in one thousand pounds the condemnation of this sussex gentleman struck a terror through a wide circle of sojourners in the metropolis i find accounts pathetic enough of their packing away on all sides for fear of the worst and gentlemen grumbling that they should be confined to their houses and this was sometimes backed to by a second proclamation respecting their wives and families and also widows which was duris sermo to the women it is nothing pleasing to all says the letter-writer but least of all to the women to encourage gentlemen to live more willingly in the country says another letter-writer all game-fowl as pheasants partridges ducks as also hares are this day by proclamation forbidden to be dressed or eaten in any inn here we find realized the argument of mr justice best in favour of the game laws it is evident that this severe restriction must have produced great inconvenience to certain persons who found a residence in london necessary for their pursuits this appears from the manuscript diary of an honest antiquary sir simon's dues he has preserved an opinion which no doubt was spreading fast that such prosecutions of the attorney-general were a violation of the liberty of the subject most men wondered at mr noy the attorney-general being accounted a great lawyer that so strictly took away men's liberties at one blow confining them to reside at their own houses and not permitting them freedom to live where they pleased within the king's dominions i was myself a little startled upon the first coming out of the proclamation but having first spoken with the lord coventry lord keeper of the great seal at islington when i visited him and afterwards with sir william jones one of the king's justices of the bench about my condition and residence at the said town of islington and they both agreeing that i was not within the letter of the proclamation nor the intention of it neither i rested satisfied and thought myself secure laying in all my provisions for housekeeping for the year ensuing and never imagined myself to be in danger till this unexpected censure of mr palmer passed in the star chamber so having advised with my friends i resolved for a remove being much troubled not only with my separation from records but with my wife being great with child fearing a winter journey might be dangerous to her he left islington and the records in the tower to return to his country seat to the great disturbance of his studies it is perhaps difficult to assign the cause of this marked anxiety of the government for the severe restriction of the limits of the metropolis and the prosecution of the nobility and gentry to compel a residence on their estates whatever were the motives they were not peculiar to the existing sovereign but remained transmitted from cabinet to cabinet and were even renewed under charles the second at a time when the plague often broke out a close and growing metropolis might have been considered to be a great evil a terror expressed by the manuscript writer before quoted complaining of this deluge of building that we shall be all poisoned with breathing in one another's faces 
the police of the metropolis was long imbecile notwithstanding their strong watches and guards set at times and bodies of the idle and the refractory often assumed some mysterious title and were with difficulty governed we may conceive the state of the police when london apprentices growing in number and insolence frequently made attempts on bridewell or pulled down houses one day the citizens improving some ordnance terrified the whole court of james the first with a panic that there was a rising in the city it is possible that the government might have been induced to pursue this singular conduct for i do not know that it can be paralleled of pulling down new-built houses by some principle of political economy which remains to be explained or ridiculed by our modern adepts it would hardly be supposed that the present subject may be enlivened by a poem the elegance and freedom of which may even now be admired it is a great literary curiosity and its length may be excused for several remarkable points an ode by sir richard fanshawe upon occasion of his majesty's proclamation in the year sixteen thirty commanding the gentry to reside upon their estates in the country now war is all the world about and everywhere erinyes reigns or of the torch so late put out the stench remains holland for many years hath been of christian tragedies the stage yet seldom hath she played a scene of bloodier rage and france that was not long composed with civil drums again resounds and ere the old are fully closed receives the wounds the great gustavus in the west plucks the imperial eagle's wing than whom the earth did ne'er invest a fiercer king only the island which we sow a world without the world so far from present wounds it cannot show an ancient scar white peace the beautifulest of things seems here her everlasting rest to fix and spread the downy wings over the nest as when great jove usurping reign from the plagued world did her exile and tied her with a golden chain to one blest isle which in a sea of plenty swam and turtles sang on every bough a safe retreat to all that came as ours is now yet we as if some foe were here leave the despised fields to clowns and come to save ourselves as twere in walled towns hither we bring wives babes rich clothes and gems till now my sovereign the growing evil doth oppose counting in vain his care preserves us from annoy of enemies his realms to invade unless he force us to enjoy the peace he made to roll themselves in envied leisure he therefore sends the landed heirs whilst he proclaims not his own pleasure so much was theirs the sap and blood of the land which fled into the root and choked the heart are bid their quickening power to spread through every part o oh, twas an act not for my muse to celebrate nor the dull age until the country air infuse a purer rage and if the fields as thankful prove for benefits received as seed they will to quite so great a love a virgil breed nor let the gentry grudge to go into those places whence they grew but think them blessed they may do so who would pursue the smoky glory of the town that may go till his native earth and by the shining fire sit down of his own hearth free from the griping scrivener's bands and the more biting mercer's books free from the bait of oiled hands and painted looks the country too even chops for rain you that exhale it by your power let the fat drops fall down again in a full shower 
and you bright beauties of the time that waste yourselves here in a blaze fix to your orb and proper clime your wandering rays let no dark corner of the land be unembellished with one gem and those which here too thick to stand sprinkle on them believe me ladies you will find in that sweet light more solid joys more true contentment to the mind than all town toys nor cupid there less blood doth spill but heads his shafts with chaster love not feathered with a sparrow's quill but of a dove there you shall hear the nightingale the harmless siren of the wood how prettily she tells a tale of rape and blood the lyric lark with all beside of nature's feathered choir and all the commonwealth of flowers inst pride behold you shall the lily queen the royal rose the gilly flower prince of the blood the courtier tulip gay and close the regal bud the violet purple senator how they do mock the pomp of state and all that at the surly door of great ones wait plant trees you may and see them shoot up with your children to be served to your clean boards and the fairest fruit to be preserved and learn to use their several gums tis innocence in the sweet blood of cherry apricots and plums to be imbrued End of section forty five